Hello everybody. So today's lecture is going to be on the module for cells and batteries. And uh, let's look at a schematic for this first one, which is a cell. And we also call this picture getting down to the cellular level. Anyway, bad puns aside. Um, pretty simple. Short line, long line, short line is for the negative side of the cell. And when we put multiple cells together, we get a battery, or the schematic symbol for a battery. Now, let's just hypothetically say that this cell is 1.5 volts. And that's a DC voltage. But 1.5 volts. And let's say, and it kind of looks like it is, let's say each of these cells are connected to each other in series, and they're each 1.5 volts. That would mean from the start to the end, if you want to think of it that way, or from the positive to the negative side of the battery, our total voltage would be 1.5 volts and we could add up each one, or we could just count each cell and multiply by the number of cells. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1.5 volts times 6 cells equals 9 volts. Because they're connected in series. We have 6 voltage rises. And so our total voltage for this battery would be 9 volts, for example. Now, you could also take two car batteries that are 12 volts each. And you could connect them in parallel. negative, positive, negative. If you go from positive to positive, and negative to negative, those would be in parallel, but you would still only have 12 volts, right? Because they would be in parallel with each other. So that's just kind of some general conceptual thing, things to uh, relate past theory knowledge with these batteries that we're going to talk about today. So let's remember from the last lecture, one of our methods of producing EMF, electromotive force, is a chemical reaction. And that's exactly what we use to construct cells, or we rely on that chemical reaction to determine what type of electrodes and electrolyte we use in the construction of a cell. We put those cells together to make a battery or we just use the components of a cell or a battery to make one battery. Either way, that chemical reaction is going to be what separates the negative particles from the positive particles. We're going we're gonna to use that re uh, reaction to get them one side and the other. We're going to divide them up. And then we're going to hook up a circuit or put this battery into a circuit maybe your remote control or maybe a solar panel circuit, some kind of thing. And we're going to use that electrical energy. We're going to use that electromotive force. Because once we use the chemical reaction to have negative particles over here, positive particles over here, and we hook it up to a circuit, you may remember that that's how we allow current to flow through the circuit. And the negative will go to the positive, and because of the chemical reaction, it will keep moving the particles from one side to the other, and then the circuit will continue to use that electrical energy. Now, in general, the larger the battery, the more electrical energy there is. Because the larger the battery, the more chemicals we have reacting to each other, creating that difference in charge. So these are 1.5 volt cells or batteries and that chemical reaction, you know, this, this top post up here 
this is going to be the positive and the negatives on the bottom. So we have that potential difference. Now for these four, it's, it's going to be about 1.5 volts. This guy up here uh, looks like it's saying 900 volts, but we can change that based on how we connect the cells together. Now, a larger bat battery in general is going to have more capacity and it's going to be able to put out more amperage. Now, ampacity is what kills us. Okay, just a little, little safety blurb, I guess. The potential difference between a human and an electrical source, for example, is what's going to allow current to flow. And if there's too much current flowing through the human body, your heart will stop. So the bigger the battery, the more dangerous it becomes. That's why this, this little guy, this little probably a triple A, is not as dangerous as a car battery. And so on and so forth. The bigger the battery, the more electrical energy it has, the more electrical energy it has, or, you know, we could also call that power. We would assume that there's more current available to do harm. So, but in general, the bigger the battery, the bigger its capacity. So that's why something like a AAA is in a remote control and your car battery runs all of the electronics in your car. It's a much bigger battery. So these are both examples of batteries, of course, but these are both what we would call dry cell batteries. There's no, there's not really a liquid sloshing around in here. We would also call these primary cell batteries. And as far as I know, there's primary and secondary cell batteries. And all that means is the primary cell is a battery that cannot be recharged. So these are, once you use up the energy in these types of primary cell batteries, that's it. You can't recharge them. Versus a, I mean, once again, back to the car battery, which is a wet cell and a secondary cell. So your car battery, you can recharge. It has a sulfuric acid sloshing around in there. We'll get to that in a little bit, but these small sort of general purpose batteries are dry cells and they're primary. You can get secondary cell uh, batteries of these types, but usually they're primary cells. And here is a cross section. They, somebody dissected a battery here just to, just to show us one of the simpler sort of pairs of chemicals or pairings of chemicals when it comes to batteries. We got this carbon post just right in the middle here, and that functions as the positive terminal based on the reaction with the zinc or this zinc chloride, ammonium chloride, some type of paste. Okay, and the zinc can, it's called, or this zinc case is how the negative terminal gathers its negative particles that it loves so much. So these have mostly been replaced by alkaline batteries or usually alkaline batteries are paired with manganese, I believe it is, not magnesium. So alkaline manganese batteries have mostly replaced these zinc carbon batteries. But this is just sort of a cross section to show you the general idea of these dry cell types of batteries. And so let's start talking about um, lead acid batteries. And there's, there's about three types, um, two general categories, but the really basic cross section, if you will, is this, these positive plates that are all connected and these negative plates that are all connected here. And then they have their respective posts. This would be our negative post, of course, and this would be our positive. And this separator allows these two plates to not just keep touching each other and allows them to actually create their, or it's one of the things, the separator is one of the things that allows these plates to have their potential difference. And then if, uh, you know, this is going to go into a case and that case is going to be for a car battery, we're just going to pour in some sulfuric acid and water 
and that's going to create our lead acid battery. Specifically, a lead acid flooded cell battery. Now, here we have our basic car battery. There's caps with vents, so someone's going to be able to maintain these batteries. They're going to be able to check the um, specific gravity, which is a term we we talk about for flooded cell lead acid batteries. Now, one of the problems with this flooded cell lead acid battery is it requires some maintenance because the electrolyte that facilitates the chemical reaction, which is how we get, you know, from post to post, if we were to measure it, we're going to get probably about 12 to 14 volts DC. But as that chemical reaction happens, the mixture of sulfuric acid and water becomes basically water. So the right balance, and it's not one to one, but the right balance of acid and water is what is required for this type of battery because that balance of lead and acid is the electrolyte that these plates of lead sit in. Now this is a very common type of battery. It's relatively cheap. It's in pretty much every car, or at least every combustion engine car, which is still probably the most popular car type of car that's on the road today. These are also used in forklifts, in uh, scissor lifts. If you've ever, um, I mean, you should check the batteries before you get in a scissor lift and put yourself, you know, 20, 30, 40, 60 feet in the air. Most scissor lifts, um, well, the battery powered ones, that is, have a flooded cell lead acid battery. Now, even though these flooded lead acid cell, flooded cell lead acid batteries, these lead acid batteries, I should just start saying, even though they're cheap and they require maintenance, the fact that they're in cars and scissor lifts means that they have you know, qualified maintenance personnel looking at these things pretty much all the time. Every time you get your car serviced, the mechanic is should check out the battery or they're at least able to check out the battery while they have your car in the shop. Um, if you do your own oil changes, you should check your battery, especially, especially come winter time. And the same with uh, scissor lifts, the ones we get from rental companies. I mean, they should... So he's uh, sometimes a gamble and maybe determines what rental company you go with, but they should be checking the batteries and doing regular maintenance on them every time the scissor lifts come in and go out. These may also be used for a UPS or uninterrupted power supply. That's what UPS stands for. Now it still requires that maintenance, but Maybe you have a qualified maintenance team that already checks many other things in a building or some place that you want a UPS. So sure, just add this lead acid battery that's used as a UPS onto their list. Now one thing they should be checking as your batteries get used is what's what I said was a specific gravity test. Now the acid to water mixture doesn't just evaporate as soon as the battery discharges itself. It's going to go through multiple, you know, discharge charge ratios or, or um, scenarios, maybe I should say. So as you use the scissor lift and you're driving around and you're, you're popping wheelies and doing crazy dangerous stuff in your scissor lift, don't actually do that. You can get, you can get hurt pretty easily on a scissor lift, but as you're using the batteries, to power that machine all day, the charge goes down and then you plug it into the wall or some kind of receptacle. And that 120 volt circuit, usually 120 volt circuit should be for most scissor lifts. Anyway, that's gonna bring your charge back up. But as the solution in the batteries 
starts to become more water than acid. The specific gravity test is a test they do to see that ratio between acid and water. Now, if it's all water, then your charge is zero. If it's all acid, 100% sulfuric acid, it's probably going to melt through the case or something. You don't want you don't want just pure acid. But this ratio this ratio check of you know the specific gravity test or the specific gravity of the battery. You know, there's that maintenance cost to it. You have to pay a person to check it, and you have to pay for the, uh, I believe it's a, a hydrometer is the tool they use to check this specific gravity. But in general, the lead acid, the flooded cell lead acid battery is usually still cheaper than the sealed cell. So here we have our first lead, ac lead acid sealed cell battery. Now this still has some venting, probably probably vented out right about in this little hole, uh, just to let some air escape if needed. But normally the chemical reaction just produces water, which then gets absorbed back into the battery. The you know big upside to these sealed cells is the fact that they're very low on maintenance requirements. Basically check them once a year and you're good. Now the gel type I'm going to talk about AGM is the other type of sealed cell. But this one is the gelled type. So instead of that sulfuric acid water mixture that are both, you know, liquids, this has a gel that facilitates the chemical reaction. The gel is going to function as our electrolyte. Now, these gelled types, uh, I believe, are usually the most, as far as I can, t can tell and have seen, are usually the most expensive type. You might see these in off-road vehicles because of the fact that with this gel, they can, these batteries can be jostled around and used on jumps and thrown all about and they don't get discouraged from doing what they do. But the gel type does take longer to recharge and you do have to recharge them properly. Can't just, can't just hook whatever, you know, can't just put 12 volts on this thing and let her buck. That might harm this battery. And so the other type of sealed cell or sealed lead acid battery is this AGM. Now this is a bit of a extreme <laughs> picture. They also come in just regular battery cases as well. But this is to highlight this important part for AGM batteries, which is these vents, these pressure releases. Now the AGM stands for absorptive glass mat. Um, AGM is probably the thing to remember, but you know, maybe you'll have a question. Not sure if you'll have a question on what the acronym stands for, but it's written in your module as well. So just, you know, stick to that. These do have better, um, capacity and output than our flooded cell, but you know, that usually comes with a bit more cost. So this is our, once again, the same picture from before for our general battery construction. We need an electrolyte. We have a case to keep everything together. We have a positive and negative electrode. Now for our NICAD batteries or nickel cadmium batteries, we just have this one positive electrode, this positive post, and then the case, which is made of the, which is where the cadmium comes in, the case is going to function as the negative electrode. Now, some great advantages of the nickel cadmium battery. Uh, they function, you know, depending on the, the, the type and, and what your sources are, but they function from about minus 40 Celsius to 70 Celsius. So really useful uh, 
battery backup source. They also discharge basically all of the electrical energy in them, and then you can recharge them. Most batteries and most types of uh, backup batteries, you don't want to discharge them all the way down to zero because they sometimes won't recharge properly. For example, your car battery, when it's dead, when your battery dies, which can happen from too much water. You know, if you have more water than acid in that flooded cell lead acid battery, the water will freeze and damage, damage the components. But this nickel cadmium, it's good for minus 40, or it can function up to minus 40. So if you're using these as a battery backup for airplane electronics, you know, which goes up into the, into the sky where it can be quite cold, this would be a very useful battery source. Now they're starting to get phased out, the nickel cadmiums. Um, cadmium is very dangerous to humans. And when it gets absorbed into our, our bodies, in some way, it can cause cancer, and it takes a long time for cadmium to leave your body. You basically just have to wait for your body to do its thing and, you know, do your daily business and let the cadmium leave you that way. But they're still in some use. Um, but superior technology has definitely been surpassing the, the NICAD cell, and that superior technology is... The common thing we see today, which is a lithium battery. Now, most modern cordless power tools use lithium ion batteries. For example, this, um, you know, yellow and black battery. I'm not trying to encourage any company over another because, well, none of the companies have paid me to sell their batteries to um, electricians. But this is a lithium ion battery. It's a, it's a 20 volt battery. And this is a super common type of battery for cordless power tools. You got a little check there. Oh, okay, cool. Now, a nice thing about lithium ion batteries is they're okay in the cold. They, they, they do okay. They hold a charge for a long time. So those two things alone are big advantages for power tools. You know, maybe you're not going to use them every day. You don't want to charge them every day. If they get too hot, they usually, they should shut themselves down. And the battery charger, you know, use a charger that matches. And once again, this is some kind of black and yellow brand of, of some kind that somebody wrote on. But you see right here, it says hot, cold delay. Now, when lithium gets too hot, it can light on fire. So if the battery, if this battery was too hot and I put it on the charger and it started charging the battery, doing its thing, that might cause even more heat, which could light this thing on fire. Lithium, lithium ion batteries are used in electronics, like cell phones. So that Samsung phone that was lighting on fire and burning people's faces and doing horrible things. Um, that's what happens when lithium batteries get too hot. Now, lithium likes to play nice with a variety of different types of batteries. So usually we just say lithium ion, but there's all kinds of lithium this, that, and the other that's coming out these days. Um, it's pretty good stuff. It's, it's pretty cool what, what they're doing with lithium batteries, but that great new technology comes, comes at a cost. Lithium, it's not exactly cheap. If you've had to buy a new lithium ion battery for your, for your drill or your cordless power tools, you, you probably have seen that, uh, that crazy price of a hundred dollars a battery or, or something, something like that. Now, when we recharge a battery, like this big fancy battery charging station is meant to do, we're going to send electrons in the opposite direction that the battery usually discharges them in. When we reverse the current flow back through the battery, 
we cause the battery to start recharging. We're going to put a charge back into it. Now there's some concerns with that. For example, when you're recharging a lead acid battery, a flooded cell lead acid battery, back to that classic example, when you're recharging it, it produces some nasty fumes sometimes. Now, if that is in a car, this is, I'm going to give up drawing this car because this is getting pretty bad. But, and I guess it's a Volkswagen Beetle of some kind. Sure, I'll have to finish driving it. But as you're driving your car down the road, the harmful fumes are just going to get vented out. And that's no problem because your alternator charges your battery or recharges it while you drive. And if charging a lead acid battery causes it to release these harmful fumes, well, it doesn't matter when you're driving a car because there's air passing by this car all the time. But when we're using batteries as backup power in buildings, and we have these systems designed to charge the battery correctly and carefully, those batteries that are indoors in a room, that room needs to be vented properly because you got harmful fumes possibly being produced. Now back to this charger, somebody's charger, I have no idea whose it is, somebody wrote all over this thing. But this is charging a lithium battery, and as I said, it has these built-in safety features. You can't just take 20 volts and just apply it to a battery. That's probably not going to charge it very well. So we, this charger, we use these kind of things, takes in 120 volts and does its thing across these prongs to slowly recharge the lithium ion battery. And you can even see on the battery, we have a, I'm not sure if that shows up on the camera well, but basically right here, this says B negative, right here is our B positive. And then we have these other um, tabs and teeth that have their functions as well. But this charger, I'm just using as an example to say that when we're charging batteries, a lot of care and caution and thought needs to be put into what type of battery you're charging, how you're charging it, is the charger designed for the battery. Now, I know this type of one is, not only because they match in color, but it fits perfectly. Now that doesn't mean it's the right charger for it, but I bought them together, so pretty safe to say that this charger is designed for that battery. Now when we hook up batteries in parallel, they sort of share their charge. They'll balance each other out, if you want to think of it that way. And that's exactly how we boost other people's car batteries when they die. When the car battery dies, that is. So if this was our good battery, this is our bad battery, or chargeless or de-energized battery, we hook up our positive to positive, and then we take our negative, and we go far away and clamp it onto some grounded piece of metal of the car. Now, if we were to connect this to the negative, and those harmful fumes had accumulated and we're connecting this wire, we're completing the circuit right here, that could cause a spark right beside those harmful fumes. So don't do that. That's quite dangerous actually. You just go positive, positive, negative, negative. And then we do this with our good battery in the car, in our, in our car that's running. It's, it's parked right in front of this other car. Anyway, so the alternator for this car that's with the good battery that's running, and it's running because the battery helped the starter turn the car on. So the alternator continues to maintain this battery while it shares its charge with the bad battery. And then given enough time, this bad battery will start its own car, and then its alternator, hopefully it's working, 
the alternator will get this battery charged back up. That's why when you boost your car after the battery dies, you should drive around for a bit, let the alternator recharge it. Or, you can just take that battery, and just use, you know, a charger. Sometimes they're on wheels, and they, they got a big handle, whatever they are. And it's a device that's meant to charge car batteries, to charge 12 volt. You'll see them in mechanic shops. They have machines that are designed to recharge 12 volt batteries. So those are some of the things about what happens when we're charging batteries. So back to this mysterious unknown black and yellow battery with some weird person's initials written on it. This is a 20 volt battery, but it's also a two amp hour lithium ion battery. Now, what that two amp hours means and depends on the company and what they, how many hours they're referring that two amp hours is good for. But just for example, to see what kind of, what kind of uh, amperage I can get out of this thing. I'm going to work about four hours, maybe let's say I'm working those whole four hours, right? Cause after four hours, I'm going to go for lunch or after those four hours, I'm going to go home unless they're paying me overtime, but maybe I charge this thing in between regular hours and overtime. Who knows? Maybe I work longer, but let's just assume I'm working four hours and I have a two amp hour battery. Now, two amp hours over four hours. We'll cancel out the H's and that's going to give me 0 0.5 amps over that time. So if, if the battery said, Hey, I'm good for eight hour or I'm good for 20 amp hours and an eight hour shift, you would just plug those numbers into here to see what kind of amperage it's going to give you in that amount of time. Now for figuring out the, we're going to, they're going to ask us to figure out the internal resistance. And this is our battery right here. If we remember from our series circuits to figure out a specific resistance, for example, this resistance, we need to know the volt drop across there. And so this, this is V equals 2.2. .2. This would be our E. And our terminal voltage, we could say is our V term. And so between the two of them, we can see from these two measurements, we're losing about one volt being dropped across that resistor. Now, this voltage, the E, is measured open circuit or no load. And then this is a closed circuit. It has a load. This battery only has so much power. And if power is equal to E times I, well, once current goes across the resistance or goes through this battery, and there's a volt drop because of the resistance of the battery, the P is going to be relatively the same, but now that we're drawing 200 amps from this 2.2 volt battery, our voltage is going to drop down to 1.2 volts. And so if we want to know the resistance of the battery or the resistance of the internal functions of the battery, we would have to use that volt drop, which is one volt over, we have this current value we can use. And that's going to give us the resistance of the battery. Now they could also give us different values. So if we want to know the terminal voltage and we had the current of the load and the resistance of the battery, well, voltage terminal might be equal to E minus I times R of the battery. And the reason I know it's that is because I times R of the battery is 
the same thing as my volt drop, which would be equal to I times R. What I'm looking for, the voltage dropped due to the resistance of the battery. So it would be I, because that current's going to go through everything, I times the R of the battery. Or I could also find my terminal voltage by just taking E minus my voltage drop of the battery. So those are just kind of some, nothing here is, you know, new formulas or anything, but when we're dealing with batteries, sometimes it's a little bit different than what we're used to. Anyway, that's it for cells and batteries. Uh, send me your questions if you have them.